This week on Crossfeed, church growth and church shrinkage. Bobby Jindal's secret past. Street Fighter, youth pastor edition. Take off your hat in church or die. And can we honor fallen soldiers with a cross? Hello, everyone, and welcome to CrossFeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, Pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church in Delaware, Iowa. Hey, I'm Pastor Jim Butler out here in Dedham, Massachusetts. Welcome, everybody. Good to have you with us again for another week, another episode. As we now are looking at winter finally ending. Yeah, it's uh, it's been in the, it, it was like 67 today here. Okay, um, we're, we're, that's that's coming this way. It'll be actually it's supposed to be close to sixty this weekend, but on Monday we had 12, we had uh, fifteen inches of snow. Yeah. So that's, that's, we're so, getting there. So I'm excited. We're supposed <laughs> to. I uh, mute button, dude. Um. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'm I'm excited that we uh, I. We were we've been paying like way too much for way too slow DSL, and uh, which is all we have available here. Well, actually, there's a wireless deal available too, um, and so I checked on their price, and then I called our telephone company, and um, which is also our DSL provider, and I said, um, "You guys need to give us a better deal for what we're paying," and uh, and so they offered me a package deal that. Uh, basically, it's going to double our bandwidth uh, up to 1.5, which still isn't great, um, but it's still double what we have. And uh, and and they're also throwing in uh, uh, caller ID and like a whole bunch of there. It was like pick four things, and we were having a hard time coming up with anything else that we really wanted. But um, so we've got some other stuff that we don't want. I don't like call waiting. I think it's rude, but. So we uh, we got that, and they're knocking twenty dollars off of our phone bill. So I'm pretty happy. <laughs> so hopefully that means that our next episode, because this doesn't kick in until tomorrow, of course, um, our next episode should have slightly smoother video. Um, I'm also going to mention uh, I've been talking about you know using the bigger sizes. Um, and I increased the size a little bit, but I, I mean, I, I doubled the size of the video, but I didn't really increase the throughput of the data. In other words, um, quality went down. And I kind of realized that after I posted it. And so here's the deal. This one, uh, which anybody watching, the, you know, I'm talking the video now, um, anybody watching this is already knows that uh, this is a much larger file size, can take longer to download. Uh, in fact, I'm basically getting about double the file size up to about 300 megs. And um, so I really want to know from people, is it too much? Do you, is it okay if we keep putting it? That's, I did some checking around and most of the um, sort of professional uh, podcasts that are doing it at this size, that's the file size that they're using. And, um, so I'm hoping that that's okay. If, if it's a problem, let me know and we'll drop the, uh, we'll drop the quality down or we'll drop the, the size down. So I'd also like to know from people that watch the video, where do you watch it? You watch it on your computer screen. Are you watching it? Obviously, um, you know, if you're watching it on YouTube or, or one of the other, uh, video sharing sites, it's not going to matter. We're still going to use the same format we've always used for those. Um, but, uh, if you watch the podcast, are you watching it? Are you watching it at crossfeednews.com slash podcast? Which by the way, if you're watching it on one of those video sites, go to crossfeednews.com slash podcast instead. And it's a higher quality there. Um, are you watching, you know, do you, are you subscribed to the podcast? Do you, are you watching it in iTunes or, or some other, are you watching it on an iPod or some other handheld video player? Um, are you, are you putting it up on your TV? You know, how are you watching it? Because that makes a difference. If everybody's just watching it on a little iPod screen, um, especially the, you know, the classic, not the touch, then 320 by 240 is enough. 
But if uh, you know if you're watching it on a touch, if you're watching it on a larger screen, then you're going to want something bigger. So we really would like to hear from you. You can email us at podcast at crossfeednews.com and let us know uh, what are you watching this on and what file size do you consider too big? Is 300 megabytes per episode too big, or uh, or is that okay? So, and if you don't know what I'm talking about. And or you want some clarification, by all means, ask us about that too. Again, the email is podcast at crossfeednews.com. So where should we start tonight? Okay. That sounds good. Um, I don't know. Uh, oh, let's start with uh, church growth or the lack thereof, because okay. you're an evangelism uh, exec, so this this should be of deep interest to you. Yep. yep. Um. And uh, basically, that a lot of Christian churches are declining. Um, the two largest, the Roman Catholics and the Southern Baptists, both posted. This is from 2006 to 2007. So uh, both uh, uh, lost members. Um, the Roman Catholic Church uh, lost uh, 400,000, roughly. Um, and the um, Southern Baptists lost um, 40,000 which was, for them, a quarter of 1% drop. But then uh, <clears throat> some other ones are, uh, have um, posted bigger uh, drops. Uh, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, our denomination, was 1.5%. Percent. Um, percent, 1.5%. Uh, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America was over 1%. The Presbyterian Church USA was 3%. And the United Church of Christ, a whopping 6%. Now, the interesting thing is, to me, about the United Church of Christ, this was when they were making the big uh, uh, ad campaign about God opens doors and don't put yep. a period where God has put a comma. How and, inclusive you know, they are, yep. And, and we had the bouncers at the door. Um, but, uh, you know, that's a, that's a pretty substantial drop. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, now um, they list. Now, of course, this is the Associated Press, which lists uh, Mormons and um, Jehovah's Witnesses up with uh, other Christians, um, which we wouldn't. Uh, and um, so, but the, the Mormons are up one point six percent. Jehovah's Witnesses are up two percent. See, that doesn't surprise me because they're out witnessing. You know, they're they're out. They're banging on doors. They're they're getting involved. They're doing evangelism. All right, um, that should be a wake up call for all of us. And and in fact, I'll mention and we'll we'll talk about this more in a minute. Got a couple other numbers to throw at you, but um, you know what what they're doing. You know, we we went out a few years ago and did some door to door stuff, and uh, got a comment. One of the one of our members got a comment from somebody at work whose house we had gone to. And she said, oh, so you guys are doing the Jehovah's Witnessing thing? <laughs> and it's like, no, they're doing our thing. We just don't do it as much as we should. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, also the Assemblies of God, and we've mentioned this on previous shows, they're up uh, nearly 1%. And the mm-hmm. Church of God, Cleveland, Tennessee, uh, is uh, up 2%. That's that big black denomination, right? I'm not sure what that is. I think so. I, I remember this group though. They're very fundamentalist. I remember getting some some. They, one year they did a big mailing all across um, the country, but I'm not sure that's. A, I don't know if that's a black denomination or not. There's there, no. The black denomination is the Church of God in Christ. I think. Okay. Well, if anybody knows, podcast at crossfeednews dot com. So I mean, we could look it up, but you know, right. we're lazy. <laughs> On the other hand, I mean, a, a major black church body, the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church. Uh, the AME Zion Church is down three uh, percent, um, but I think it's interesting though of the the, the truly Christian denominations there, um, the Assembly of God, the Charismatic, is, is the one that's up. But I think that makes a little bit of sense because you know as we head into postmodern people, um, that they're you know we Lutherans are are, are terribly propositional. In our our thinking and our theology, yeah, very logical. Whereas the, and, mm-hmm. whereas the assembly of God is very experiential, mm-hmm. and postmodern people tend to be looking for an experience. 
Uh, yep. For them, that often validates the truth. Uh, we'll give you a, we'll give you a, a five point argument as to why this is right. This is true. Mm -hmm. uh, they'll give you something that's more experiential. Yeah, yeah. Which also the Mormons do that too. They're they're real big on um, the, the old term that I, they don't. I don't notice them using it as much anymore. As but they used to call it the burning in my bosom. Um, yep. nowadays they use more modern language. They just say, I have this feeling or, you know, or something like that. Um, I just know it to be true or, or whatever. So, um, so yeah, there, I mean, there's, there's definitely a, um, a, a emphasis on that. And, um, you know, I, so I was looking at this and I was thinking about, you know, as, as Jim mentioned, I'm our district, uh, evangelism guy. And, um, I, uh, you know, I was thinking about, you know, I, I saw these real liberal churches are, are dropping and I went, oh, that's no big surprise. They have no doctrine. You know, people are looking for meaning and they've got nothing to offer. They're saying, well, you have to pick your own meaning, you know, and um, well, hey, if, if you don't have the answers, I'm not going to your church. You know, I want answers. And uh, and so that didn't surprise me. But then I saw that the Missouri Synod dropped um, by more than the ELCA. <laughs> and I went, well, there goes my ego, you know? <laughs> and, um, but you know, so then I thought, okay, why are we dropping? All right. And as I see it, and now this is, as I see it here in, a, um, in a very conservative, um, Midwest district of the Missouri Synod, uh, one of the most conservative districts, um, out there. And, um, and this is the way I'm looking at it, all right? There is a big argument, and this is a false argument, um, but it's an argument of doctrine versus evangelism. Which is more important, your teachings or your outreach, all right? And there are, we're sort of polarized, and not most, but there's there are significant um, vocal minorities, um, some of whom say, you got to focus on doctrine. You got to focus on doctrine. It's all about the teachings, right? And and they pick on anybody that says, "Oh, we're missional," right? And then you've got a bunch of people that are saying, "No, it's all about mission. It's all about mission. Doctrine is secondary," um, or or just you know saying, "Well, don't you know you're if you're going to get nitpicky about doctrine, then you're not doing mission work or something like that." Okay. Well, here's the thing, you know, and and this is what I always say: What is more important, doctrine? or evangelism? And the answer is yes. All right. You've got to have both. St. Paul said, speak the truth in love. And, um, and if you, you, if you're not speaking the truth to people, then you're not being very loving if you're lying to them. All right. And if you're not, if you, if you're not reaching out in love to them, then you don't really understand the truth because the truth is all about reaching out and loving people. All right. So you've got to have both. And, as I see it in the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, what we struggle with is this sort of debate about doctrine versus evangelism, which what we should really be doing is doing evangelism with our doctrine. Well, I think it's – I don't think that's the issue really. I, I like Maybe for a very vocal minority on e out there. I mean um, – but I, I to me it's – it's more that we have a field, what I call a field of dreams mentality. If you build it, they will come. We have a sign. And we feel, yeah, we have a sign, you know. Well, our doors are open. Um, and, and, and instead, of, we really expect people to come in on their own rather than us going out and taking the message to them. Mm -hmm. And um, And for years, that's what happened. You know, I mean, we were, a lot of us were into these German ethnic enclaves. And so, you know, all these other Germans came in. And we struggled, I think, to make the, the move uh, to being an outward seeking church. What's interesting is back in the 1980s, uh, Wynn and Charles Arn said the Missouri Senate had the potential to grow by 20% in the next 20 years. Uh, not everybody realizes that, but they, 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 that was a prediction that they made. They said, we had the potential to do that, in their opinion. Um, but we did have to make some changes. Uh, but we refused to make those. We refused to do it. It's, it's fun Change? to me because, you know, we, yeah, <laughs> we, um, 
you know, we, 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 we often argue – a lot of times what happens is we blame the guy – the president of our church body. When Dr. Barry was president, people, you know, we were declining, people blamed him, and now we're declining, and people blame Jerry Kishnick. You know, I, I, they can't do it. You know, they can't go out and, and motivate the pastors and stuff. There's one one thing, one list I was part of, and I would notice these guys who kept posting and kept posting, and I kind of wondered after a while, what are they doing all day? How do they find the time to do this? You know, I mean, I don't have the time to do it. There, there's one debate going on on one, one list. I'd love to love to take part in it, but I don't have the time. Mm-hmm. Now, I, I'm, I'm too busy, you know, uh, uh, you know visiting members, um, you know, visiting, uh, 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 trying to call on people who visited the church, trying to figure out how we can reach out, what kind of uh, needs we can be touching as a congregation, how we can be better in in um, children's ministry, you know, trying to expand the ministry of the church. I don't know how you find time to sit there and play on the computer all day. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then, you know, sometimes I've seen where, you know, some of these churches are doing and they're not doing that well. Well, there's a reason. Yeah. Well, you know, and the other thing is um, – all right. You ever have, you ever do like a, a friendship Sunday? Everybody bring a friend to church this week. You ever do something like that? Mm-hmm. All right. How did it go? I actually went fairly well. Did it? Okay, that's good. Because I've I've seen it, it attempted at uh, a few different churches, and like nobody came. <laughs> nobody brought anybody. You know, it was like this this four week build up. And then nobody brought anybody, you know, and, and, um, what I see in a lot of churches is people say, um, well, evangelism's the pastor's job or it's the evangelism committee's job or it's the elder's job or, you know, or whatever, but it's not my job. I'm not good at that. All right. And they see it as the, this, some sort of skill that, that you have to have, um, that you need, you need to take a class, you know, to learn how to talk about Jesus. And, you know, um, here's the thing, and I, I heard it described this way, and I, I love this analogy. All right, when a woman gets married, or when a woman gets engaged, she doesn't have to go to um, a class at the jewelers to learn how to tell people about how happy she is that she's engaged. All right? It just naturally, she gets excited, and she goes around telling people. And, you know, here we've got this great news that Jesus Christ has paid for our sins, that he's given us eternal life, you know, and, um, and we, well, I don't know how to tell people, well, you know, and, and people are uncomfortable. And we live in a society where it says, well, you don't, you know, talk about religion. That's a personal thing. And, and I say hogwash, right? It's not a personal thing. Jesus died for everybody. If you keep it to yourself. You're doing, you know, right now, uh, we're studying Jonah, uh, in our uh, Thursday morning Bible class. And, you know, Jonah wanted to keep it to himself. He didn't want those nasty Ninevites to, you know, share heaven with him. And uh, so, hey, I'm, I'm not going to tell them to repent because then they will. And God will forgive them, you know. And I'm not saying that people have that attitude, but they say, well, you know, you're asking me to step outside my comfort zone here. And Well, that's one of the tricks, though, I think people need to understand, too, is that, you know, I think a lot of people see evangelism as really getting in somebody's face and don't understand that there are different styles. We have different personalities, and so there are different ways you learn to approach people. Um, you know, there was a guy in my last church. He was from New York. He was from New York City area. Um, I mean, he was a New Yorker, get in your face. You know, here's what the Bible says type of guy. Um and I swear I have no idea how he did it. Um, I was always much quieter, um, building long-term relationships. And uh, but you know, I mean that that's part of it. But you know, and I'm wanting to do another training in my congregation, walk them through these different evangelism styles in different ways. You know, some people have got a really cool story to tell, and they can they can share that. Others are you know can can have real gifts of hospitality and can can bring p- people together. So there's a lot of things that we can be doing, uh, but it's helping people understand that it's it's okay if you can't you know get in somebody's face, 
and, and take them through the Roman road or something like that. that that's fine. Uh, there's other ways you can be doing evangelism. There's other ways you can be sharing God's Christ's love um, and, you know, then bringing them an opportunity to do that. But, you know, one of the things, though, that we discover about growing churches is that, you know, the people there tend to be excited about where they're going and they simply tend to invite people. Mm hmm. Now, we, we are not very good at inviting people. We really kind of do expect people just to show up. Um, and that's a very difficult mindset to get around that, no, they're not going to show up. Um, but rather, we need to uh, be inviting to bring them in. Right. You know, and, and it can be something as simple as saying, um, hey, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to church on Sunday. Uh, why don't you come along and uh, I'll, you know, I'll pick you up at whatever time, you know, don't like say, I'll meet you there, pick them up so that they're, you know, they're not going to get there. I see sometimes somebody will come, some guest and they'll come and they'll like sit there in their car. Like I got to sit here and wait until my friend gets here because you know, I, I, I don't know what to say or do otherwise. Okay. And then they'll sit there in their car. And, and I, I mean, before the service, I stand outside and, you know, greet people, shake their hands and welcome them and, you know, and, and stuff like that. Um, even in the cold weather, uh, we got a couple, um, older ladies that always get mad at me if it's, you know, it gets much below freezing and I'm standing outside. It's cold. You should go inside. So, but, um, I, I appreciate their love, but, um, <laughs> they, uh, you know, if you're going to bring a friend to church, bring them. You know, or I don't it, do that. Uh, I I don't greet people. In, I can't do it in the winter; it's too darn cold. But in the the, the spring, summer, and fall, I'm actually out in the parking lot talking right. to people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, yeah, that's uh, that's where I see that. And um, and then you know, one one powerful way of evangelism that you mentioned is when somebody does walk in, really be warm and welcoming to them. Yep, and that's how my church how does really well. Them. Our, our church is <laughs> our church is like fresh meat, you know. <laughs> we don't get a lot of visitors just because of where we are, you know. Uh, we're pretty rural, and and there's just not a lot of turnover in our community. So, um, but I mean, they're they're just like really friendly. I, I get comments from people that I I'll go because I always go um, whenever possible. I'll go visit any anybody that visits us, and and, uh, <laughs> and I've got comments like your church is really friendly. <laughs> That's good. That's good. But but wow. <laughs> so so maybe I, a little more. So you know, I, I say it's always better to err on that side. One other thing, since we're talking about these numbers, before we go on to the next story, um, there are a couple factors that I think do uh, come in here. Um, that is lower birth rates. All right, mm. we've had lower birth rates over the past few decades. All right, because of that, numbers are going to decline a certain degree, just because there's less people. You know, um, and uh, the other thing is, and and, and this is uh, Gen X, my generation, all right, are just not as active church people as uh, the previous, as baby boomers, as um, and the generation before that. Um, and, and I mean, that's our, that's our challenge. That's our challenge is to reach that generation because the generations before that are the ones that just come because it's there. All right. Gen Xers aren't necessarily going to do that. And in fact, they um, oftentimes feel out of place. Um, well, I, you know, that's not for me. I'm, I'm not a church person. I'm, I'm, uh, you hear this a lot. I'm spiritual, not religious. All right. Have a discussion with somebody about mm -hmm. what that means. You know, so. Um, well, that's a, um, again, that's a postmodern mindset. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's even more pronounced. With um, uh, uh, the millennials, Generation Y, my daughter's generation. But you know what? You really don't want to do. You don't want to wear a hat if you come to visit your church. <laughs> oh man, this is <clears throat> no okay. I have to say that um, you know I used to pick out the stories for the show uh, based on the most popular stories each week. All right, I still look at, at the most popular ones, but you know some of them are just not interesting. And then all, and then sometimes there's ones that that haven't had a lot of hits, but it's just like, oh man, we've got to talk about this. All right, this was one of those stories. <laughs> all right, it's one paragraph long. Yeah, it's really short. I'll read you the entire story. Uh, Baltimore, AP. 
Police said a 58-year-old man stabbed his teenage son after he refused to take off his hat at church earlier in the day. The father and his 19-year-old son got into an argument on Sunday afternoon. That's when the police said the father went to a knife, or went to the car, got a knife, and stabbed his son in the left buttock and fled. The son was taken to the University of Maryland Medical Center for treatment. The father's name was withheld pending his arrest. I don't understand why he wasn't arrested yet if he was already in the AP. <laughs> don't know. But... Paperwork, I guess. <laughs> I love this related article. Church hat row leads to buttocks. That. <laughs> right. So this didn't actually happen at church. It wasn't like, you know, hey, take off your hat. You know, this is afterward. They got into an argument about it. Okay. So at least he waited until church was done. Okay. But at the same time, he had to go to the car to get the knife. So it wasn't like he just tempers flared and, and and he happened to be like cutting potatoes at the time and all of a sudden, you know, wham or something. <laughs> like, that's it. <laughs> You're getting a knife in the butt. <laughs> you know? So so he went out to the car. All right. I please I'm not laughing here because I think that it's funny that someone got hurt. Okay. But this is ridiculous. Yes he does. <laughs> I mean, this is just, this is just, you know, this is one of those truth is stranger than fiction stories. I mean, this is just bizarre. Now, All right? Question. You know, let's let's take a look at at you know, kind of what was behind this. Um, well, there's a question of authority here. Um, you know, honor your father and mother, that kind of thing. Um, all right. But the question of wearing a hat in church. Okay. Where does that come from? All right, well, it comes from, what, Leviticus, right? Or Exodus, one of the two. Okay, where it, it says that uh, um, uh, it's a, a woman should not enter church with her head uncovered. A man should not enter the church with his head covered. And it has to do with the whole concept of headship. and That's um, Corinthians. Oh, is that? Not Leviticus. Well, no, it's or... in the Old Testament, too. It's, and then, it, yeah, yeah, but what you're just quoting is is Corinthians. Well, yeah, Paul. That's in the New it. Testament. It's in both. <laughs> Corinthians is in both. No, the head covering <laughs> thing is in both. I don't remember anything talk about head covering in in the Old Testament, especially considering the Jews, whenever they read scripture, cover their heads. That's true. And that's a tradition that goes back to Jesus, at least Jesus day. So. Uh, no, no, no. You're, what you're quoting, you're thinking of as First Corinthians. I'm sure there's something about it in the Old Testament. Okay, well, you can look it up next week, but what you just quoted okay. is First Corinthians. All right, all right, fine, fine, fine. The next time you feel like showing off, don't. Anyway, um, so there's this whole question. I just like embarrassing uh, folks. <laughs> there's a whole question of headship. And this is, I mean, this is the same issue. This ties in with, um, you know, the question of, of of women pastors, gay marriage, uh, the the role of a husband and wife, um, you know, and and positions of authority and and things like that. So, um, I mean, there's it's a really there there's a lot of 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 history behind this practice, um, but it's most people don't really understand it now. And, and the problem with the practice that if you don't understand the practice, it's kind of useless. So I still think, you know, I, I'll still, I, I've been in church and, and seen kids with their hats on and, and uh, like I walked to the back of the church to turn on the video camera that we use to tape the service for shut-ins. And, um, and I'll, as I walk past them, I'll flip their hat off and hand it to them, you know, or, or something like that. But, um, you know, if they're you know sitting by an aisle, I've done that a couple times. Um, but uh, you know, it, so it's you know I, I would say it's 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 a matter of, of respect. Um, I when we if we pray in confirmation class or at camp or something like that, guys remove your hats. You know, we're gonna pray and and that. So um, you know, it's 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 an issue of respect. 
I'm not so sure I'd go to the first Corinthians, but it is a, a thing of respect. I mean, at one time, I mean, when I was growing up, we were always told whenever you walk into a building, boys should always remove their hats. The girls didn't have to, but the you know the boys, the moment you walked in. Uh, now, uh, I know the Army, both men and women, whenever they walk inside, must take their hat, you know, must take off the beret um, or whatever their, their head covering is. Um, and that's just that's just a rule. And then when they go back out, they put it back on. Yeah, unless they're armed. Um, we were walking through the airport one time, and uh, Josh, uh, the, the guys were there with their berets on, and Josh said, the weapons are live. Um, because um, that's, that's wearing, how you knew inside the airport, because they were in the beret inside. Hmm. Otherwise, you never wear the beret inside. So that's 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 the, that's the rule. So I think there's, you know, in American society, it's always been kind of understood as a sign of respect um, that you just, you know, that's just part of the whole culture. Now, as we've gotten to this more relaxed, uh, less mannerly culture, uh, that's kind of gone away. But there's an interesting book I've got by one Baptist pastor and from Montana. He talks about... Um, a big thing that erupted when some boys in his church wore their baseball caps inside. And they said, you know, it was, it was, it was a massive thing. He couldn't figure out what the big deal was. But he said part of it up there in Montana is uh, men wear their, ba- their their cowboy hats everywhere except in church. For them, for these boys to wear baseball caps in the church was considered by them to be a huge sign of disrespect for the church. So, you know, and there's something to be said for that. You, the whole, Just the whole... Um, you notice how like dress has changed in church um, over the years, and I suppose this depends on where you are. But um, you know, I mean, when I was a kid, nobody would ever wear jeans and a t-shirt to church. I mean, it just wasn't done. Nowadays, it's pretty common. Um, mm-hmm. And and you know, I, I always say I'd rather have them there dressed like that than not at all. But at the same time. You know, sometimes we emphasize too much what a friend we have in Jesus, and we forget about holy, holy, holy. You know, I, I was talking about this with a, a kid in my confirmation class last night, and um, and I said, "All right, if you were going to go, and I and I'm sure that most of our listeners have heard this analogy, but um, but it was new to him. I mean, and and this is a kid that his parents make him um dress, at, at least put on some nice pants, and you know, and that, um, and uh." And I said, if you know, if you're going to go to the president, you know, and eat eat at the White House with the president, you know, um, at the fancy table and everything, you know, how would you dress? And his eyes kind of lit up, and he said, "Oh, really? Have to dress up for that?" And I said, "Yeah, okay. So you're going to God's house, you know. You're you're going to go to into the presence of God, and you know, when 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 you take communion, you're, you're going to eat." Um, at God's table, all right. How are you going to dress for that? You know, and and who's more important, God or the president? You know, and and so you know, it's just a sign of of acknowledging that I am going into the, the presence of God, and so therefore I am going to, um, you know, I'm going to be respectful, all right. And so you know, but at the same time, you know, it can turn into a fashion show too. Hey, Easter's coming, you know. Um, and Easter, you know, a lot of people dress up real fancy and stuff like that. And, and then it becomes like, look at me, look at me, look how dressed up I am. And I'm, you know, and, and it's like a competition. And that's not right either. All right. So there's, you know, there's extremes on in both directions. So, but, you know, I say it, if you're going to church, you know, um, think about where you're going, you know, and, and just dress appropriately, dress accordingly, you know, dress respectfully. So. Dockers is fine. I'm a I'm a Dockers and sweater guy. Um, mm-hmm. I think I actually own one. I own one suit. I only wear it for weddings and funerals. Uh, otherwise, I'm you know I'm in I'm in the office in Dockers and uh, clerical shirt with a sweater every day. Uh, actually, one of the pastors up here listening goes, "How many of those sweaters do you own anyway?" <laughs> says, every time I see you, you're in a different suit. You're, you're another uh, cardigan sweater. Well, you know, me and uh, um, 
uh, me and uh, Mr. Rogers. What can I tell you? <laughs> but but I won't stab anybody that shows up at our church, you know, wearing a hat. So <laughs> okay, that's cool. But you know, if you did, you could always teach them self defense. <laughs> You could teach them Batman self-defense. Yeah, yeah. All right. This is uh, KC, not as in like in the Sunshine Band, um, but KC. Or My Fair City, where I grew up. Oh, okay. The new home of Matt Castle. (laughs) Actually, you know, the Kansas City Chiefs up here in New England are now being called the Patriots West. (laughs) So, um, but the uh, the KC fighting method, it's a, a street fighting style um, that happened to be used in Batman Begins and The Dark Knight. Mm-hmm. Um, there is a guy by the name of Jeff McKissack who is teaching this to youth pastors in Dallas and across the country. And the idea is that that way, if you're, you know, you're out, uh, say you're out at a theme park, you know, with your youth group or whatever, and something happens, all right, pastor can step in and, you know, lay down the law with his fists, you know. (laughs) I think this is one of the silliest things I've ever read in my life. Hey, if you want to do it for self-defense, Josh took karate. For many years, not John Karate and uh, Judo. My son Josh actually is a uh, black belt in Judo. And uh, his um, sensei taught a course in women's self-defense and things to be aware of and stuff. If you're going to do that, you know, in case you're driving, walking out to the parking to the parking lot at night and you will need something to say, that's fine. But you know, if you're going to say, I'm going to protect my kids in case we get attacked, forget it. Because there's going to be more than one guy attacking a group of kids. Yeah, yeah. And, if they're uh, attacking the whole group, or else they're going to be armed. And I'm sorry, but if right. they're armed and they're going to come, and unless they're going to try, for one, you know, they're not going to like try to haul off some of the kids and abduct them or something like that if it's a group, right? Right. Um, or for that matter, if there's an adult with them, all right, they're going to look for kids that are off on their own that don't have, you know, adults with them because it's much easier and you can do it without creating a scene. Yeah. Uh, I mean, at the at the big youth gatherings that our, our church body has, I mean, we always tell our kids, don't go, don't go in anything less than a group of three. Mm-hmm. You know, five or more is even better. Always go in a large group. Nobody's going to mess with you then. Right. Because there's a group of you. Uh, one, new, one of them, the only person I knew who got injured and got jumped was some youth director who, after telling his kids never go well by your never go off by yourself, went off by himself. <laughs> so um, I used to. I mean, if if I needed to go to something, I would see another group and I'd say, "Hey, can I join you guys? You know, I don't want to, you know, walk through this by myself." Oh no, come on, you know, where are you from? And so they were always good. Um, again, well, and the other ones they talk about in this thing, you know, Fort Worth's Wedridge Baptist Church, 1999. This guy, you know, gunman killed seven and in. Killed seven and injured seven. 2007, two gun-wielding robbers tied up security guards at First Baptist, stole thousands of dollars. Guess what? Casey's not going to do you a whole lot of good if the guy's got a gun on you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, it's um, like that scene in uh, in Raiders of the Lost Ark where the guy's like mm-hmm. flinging the, the machete around and stuff and uh, going after Indiana Jones. And Indiana Jones just kind of looks at him, pulls out a gun and shoots him, you know. Which, by the way, that yeah. scene was not in the original script. Um, Harrison Ford was sick that day. There was supposed to be this big old fight scene, and um, but Harrison Ford was sick that day, and uh, and and so they they shortened up the scene, uh, so mm-hmm. something less physically demanding. Uh, a friend of mine has a copy of the original script signed by Harrison Ford, uh, so that's how I know that's that. Cool. Uh, I knew that just because I'm a geek. Yeah, and, but I, I know uh, it's yeah, true. Say, this <laughs> oh, <laughs> I did too. But yeah, that, that that's one of the. For those of us who are actually old enough to appreciate it, the you know, in, when it first came out, you know, I watched we know it that. in the theaters. Yeah, uh huh. Taking your baby bottle anyway. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but back to this thing. I mean, you know, it's you know, I I, I love the I love this one guy uh, in here though. He says, 
as Christians, we're not meant to be stomped on. Well, yeah, but like I said, hey, you know, for a personal self-discipline, for personal protection, for personal self-defense, this is fine. But don't think you're going to go out and save your your, your church youth group by by knowing this. That, that's that's silly if you ask me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you can take this guy's course and pay three thousand dollars for an extensive training program. Yeah. Uh, depending how long it is, uh, that might actually be you know pretty reasonable. Well, it says in May. I, I hope that that's not just um, like. In the month of May, as in, I hope that that means it starts in May. I mean, three thousand dollars—that's, I don't know. To me, that's a lot of money. But I live in the Midwest, so. Yep. So where should we go next? Well, Indiana or the Avi Desert? Well, you know, maybe if you know self-defense, can you beat mm-hmm. the devil out of somebody? Oh. Bobby Jindal. I what that this is one of the stupidest articles I'd ever read. Uh, Bobby Jindal's secret past. I knew all this. Yeah, it, it was actually in political commercials. <laughs> yeah, I mean this 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 goes back to you know there there. I think we actually t- I don't know if we talked about this before or if I had just posted the article about Jindal on religion. Um, but Bobby Jindal, for those of you who don't know, is the governor of Louisiana. He is he's very conservative Republican. He's probably one of the most brilliant men out there. Um, he graduated from college. I can't remember how old he was. Uh, he was in only in his 20s, and the governor of Louisiana was so impressed with him, he put him in charging uh, re- of reforming Medicare and Medicaid for the, for the state. He did a great job. He then became, I think, president of the University of Louisiana system before he was 30, uh, ran uh, two terms as congressman. And uh, then became uh, – was elected uh, governor of uh, Louisiana. And uh, uh, so, you know, age – you know, just 37 years old. Um, and uh, uh, Asian Indian is his background. Actually, his first name is actually Piyush or something like that. Yeah. But uh, when he's four years old, he loved watching the Brady Bunch. And so he named himself Bobby after Bobby Brady. And he, he named himself. He refused to answer to anything else. He told his parents, my name is Bobby. That's great. He does bear a certain resemblance. <laughs> especially, especially the brown skin, you know. Well, yeah. <laughs> and the black hair. But uh, uh, um, so. Uh, uh, so the, the all right. So he he comes from a Hindu family. Um, but he, um, he began considering, he became uh, Catholic during high school after, <laughs> hey, here, here's evangelism after being touched by the love and simplicity of a Christian girl who dreamt of becoming a Supreme court justice so she could stop her country from killing unborn babies. After watching a short black and white film on the crucifixion of Christ, Jindal claimed he realized that the gospel stories were true. If Christ was really the Son of God, it was arrogant of me to reject him and question the gift of salvation. Yep. And uh, so his family wasn't real proud of that. They basically saw it as, um, you know, if if you're rejecting our religion, you're rejecting us. But it sounds like they've sort of at least come to terms with that. Um mm-hmm. But uh, now the the sort of story here, um, and see now this is why is all this stuff you know coming up now um, when this was back in the '06 uh, gubernatorial campaign. Um, this was they actually did a this Democratic opponent did a commercial um, on about this to try to uh, put him down and he said look you're attacking my faith and and you're attacking the beliefs of a lot of people in Louisiana do you really want to do that and then they kind of covered it up real quick because he was right um and uh well what they did was they took it out to the rural areas where they're more Baptist and so that's really what they were dealing with is was trying to do some almost no nothing anti-Catholicism among the you know the mole why among the I'm sorry, any Southerners, please forgive me. 
among the Baba vote. <laughs> Somehow I don't think I'll be welcome at the country club. Okay. We in Missouri, we know down there in Arkansas, Louisiana, there's Bubba. <laughs> we know who Bubba is. So among Bubba and the hillbillies, this was this was you know this the stuff. So, but anyway, um, what uh, is interesting though is is, is is he not only became Catholic, I mean he became Catholic, and so. Um, uh, one of the things that uh, he he dealt with though was um, uh, a situation with a young woman, and um, that who had sulfuric scents hovering over her. And in the middle of the prayer meeting, um, he said uh, she she began to collapse and she could not say um, Jesus is Lord. She'd say Jesus is the the and then start swearing and cursing. And so he folded his hands and he said, Satan, I command you to leave this woman. And then she said, you know, lashed out. But then there was this great deal of, of peace and comfort that descended over her. And, of course, now in secular America where, you know, somebody's acting weird, that's a mental thing. It, there's no such things as demons. It's all pretend. Uh, you know, look at look at the wacko here. Right, right. That's how of course, seen. the guy who wrote this, I'd like to know a few things about you did in college. Toga, 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 toga. Yeah. Well, no, yeah. No, no, no. <laughs> our, our current president was smoking coke in college by his own admission, or snorting coke, uh, and, you know, by his own admission, you know, you know, and uh, 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 so, uh, uh, you know, I mean, what he do it today is another question. The other thing is that they didn't like is he, articles that he wrote. Which you know, basically, he really uh, insulted Luther and Calvin and Protestantism in general. Well, guess what? He's Catholic. Yeah. What that do you expect? His, that would what you expect. You don't notice we, uh, you know, we're Lutheran, right? We're not ashamed of being Lutheran, right? right. We acknowledge other Christians, and and we're not going to say that someone who's a Christian that believes that Jesus paid for all their sin to give them eternal life, um, you know, that they're not going to heaven. Okay. But um, but we're going to disagree with them on certain things. We're going to disagree with the teachings, all right? Right. So and um, and he's writing in a Catholic and, magazine. So what do you expect? Yeah. I mean, you know. But earlier you mentioned why is this all coming out now again and being trying trying to give, drum it up uh, because of course he did the um, response to uh, President Obama's um, not really quite the State of the Union but almost State of the Union address a couple weeks ago and. Um, so everybody knows that, you know, um, well, some saying as early as 2012, um, I'd say more likely 2016, he probably will be a presidential candidate. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, just given that he's a bit popular um, and, and you know, is really developing a name for himself, um, that he, you know, when he does decide to run, there's a pretty decent chance that he's going to end up with the nomination. Uh, I would say if he waits till 16, he'd much more likely than 12, but you yep. know, um, see, I think personally now, to be honest with you, I think this is wonderful that this is coming out now because then in 2016, old news, I mm -hmm. think we talked about that eight years ago. You know, it's been done, been there, done that, move on. Um, so I, I think, you know, for his, you know, for, that's that's you know good for him that it's really getting out there and being taken care of. He is wildly popular in Louisiana. Yeah, uh, there are those who want him to run for Senate uh, down there, and they're sure he'd be elected. But he's like, no, I don't want to do that. I'm, I just got the governor job. I want to do this one right. Um, I mean, especially if you understand Louisiana, which was just you know known for its corruption, known for you know uh, uh, the good old boy attitude, and uh, you know they had. Several other governors who, you know, very, very corrupt. And so he used his popularity, called the, 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 the legislature into special session and just about wrote the legislation that they passed, you know, just changing the ethics of the whole state, its political structure. It was really pretty incredible what he pulled off. So, I don't know. But that's good old Bobby Jindal. But speaking of the government. 
Yeah, speaking of it. Now, oh, by the way, to, to do a follow-up before we get into this uh, Mojave Desert case, um, we had the uh, – you remember the article we had a, a few months ago about uh, Summon? Remember, they, mm-hmm. they, there was the National Park, and they had the Ten Commandments, and now the followers of some of them you know, wanted to have it, and so they, they, they brought it up. Um, they were turned down. They lost that case, the followers of some of them, mm-hmm. uh, because uh, the uh, government uh, – uh, did it go to the Supreme Court? I don't remember. I read the article, but it was like a week or two ago, and I don't remember the details. I, I can't remember if it was the Supreme Court or if it was a federal court. But whichever court went to said, yes, you have the right to free speech. Yes, you have the right to enrich your religion. The, and if you want to go out in the middle of the park and screen this, that's perfectly fine. Go ahead. However, the Park Service has the right to say what monuments it will and will not accept. Because this will be a permanent thing in the ground, then it has the right to say yes to this one and no to that one. Yep. So yeah, if they want to go out there and you know take turns just having somebody out there reciting it and you know twenty four seven, as long as it's you know the park doesn't close at night or something, you know you're good to go. Um, but uh, but yeah, you just can't you know plant the thing there. So. All right. So anyway, now this one. So this is a situation out in the Mojave Desert um, at a national preserve, and there is a cross that has stood up there. Uh, an eight-foot tall, tall cross the Mojave National Preserve in San Bernardino. Um, a smaller wooden cross was um, put up uh, in 1934 and uh, been maintained as a war memorial by the, ninth, by the National Park Service. And uh, for some reason, the ACLU objected to this cross. Now, this is it's, it's, it's a war memorial. It's on honor of fallen soldiers. Everybody understands that. And um, and they did, did denied to have a Buddhist shrine erected near this cross. That would our, our friends some of them. Now that's going to be interesting to see how that gets added into that because that that case will come up. And the Ninth Circuit U.S. the U.S. Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals ruled on the side of the ACLU, saying the cross was an impermissible governmental endorsement of religion and must come down. Um, Congress uh, then. Uh, um, uh, gave the VFW one acre of land that the cross stands on, so it's technically now private, private property, but the Ninth Circuit's unstrated, and once it tear down, um, the Bush administration took it to the Supreme Court, said it was a seriously misguided decision, um, and, you know, why tear down a cross that stood without incident for 70 years as a memorial to fallen service members? And, um, by the way, before I go any further, you do realize one interesting thing about the Ninth Circuit? Uh, it has an interesting honor among all the circuit courts in the United States. What's that? You know what it is? It has been overruled by the Supreme Court more times than any other circuit. <laughs> <laughs> Often unanimously. Wow. It is by far the most liberal circuit. And, uh, yeah, it, it has the honor of being overruled more times than, than any other circuit in the United States. You know, the ACLU of California is following me on Twitter now. <laughs> I'm not sure why, <laughs> but it's making me nervous. <laughs> Crossfeed News is brushing his teeth. <laughs> Ooh, look, man! We better be low! Anyway. Um... <laughs> um. So this is this is going to uh, uh, come up um, this ne- in the new term of this fall. Yep. So I mean, you know, this is this is a story we've we've kind of hashed through in various uh, forms and stuff like that. The thing that I look at with this one though is that the thing's been there for seventy years. You know why now? Obviously, none of the the families you know that are that were involved in, in putting it up, nobody from the community, you know, and that kind of thing had any problem with it. And now just all of a sudden they're complaining about it. Right. And, and the thing is, is this is not meant to be, and it's kind of weird to even say this because it's a cross, which is a religious symbol, but it's not really intended to be a religious symbol per se. It's mm-hmm. an odd, you know, it's about fallen war dead. 
you know, and the fallen war dead may be Christian, maybe atheist, maybe Jewish, maybe Muslim, uh, maybe um, no religious preferences. As I, you know, I had one chaplain say, you know, even you know, talk to the guys. He, he he was a Navy chaplain and talking to the guys in the boat, and you know, and he goes, "Well, I'm I'm no religious preferences chaplain." Well, that's good because I'm the no religious preferences chaplain. I'm glad <laughs> to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> and I just sat there and said, like, you guys don't really talk that way on the boat. Do you? Oh, military, we, we have our own language. So, I mean, but, you know, the idea is, you know, it's just the same thing at um, Arlington Cemetery. I mean, if you've ever been to Arlington, um, and there are rows upon rows upon rows of crosses. You know, it's not that these guys are, you know, it, it, it's signifying here is someone who has died. You know, it's really not meant to be a symbol so much of Christianity. Right. Um, but, man, I'll tell you what, you walk through that cemetery, you see those rows and rows of crosses, of, and it's just one of the most moving experiences you'll have in your life. My wife and oldest daughter have been there. They watched the changing of the card and, and, and all that kind of stuff um, uh, well, a couple of years ago. So I was not able to be there. And it's, you know, it's one of those things that I want to do someday. Um, just haven't been able to yet. Yep. Used to be, uh, Robert E. Lee's, uh, plantation. Yep. But anyway, so it's a very, very meaningful, very, but anyway, so this, this is the same type of thing. Um, I don't know. It'd be interesting to, you know, how can they say it's an impermissible endorsement of religion? Nobody's preaching. Nobody's doing anything. It's just a cross sitting there. It's the same thing happened at uh, you know the, the, there's the famous cross at uh, at ground ground zero that you know kind of you know it was it was these two girders just you know thrown together yeah and a lot of people prayed a lot of chaplains did stuff there but and you know now it's a, its own little area there by itself but nobody ever saw that I well I think they saw it as a religious symbol and a place of a lot of comfort but at the same time they didn't see it necessarily as um, an exclusionary. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exclusionary. Yeah. Yeah. Now, at Arlington, they can choose, um, instead of a um, a cross, they can choose like a Star of David or, or something like that instead. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas right. here, it's but, just a cross. But there's nobody buried. I mean, it's just a cross right. sitting there just with this is in honor of our war dead. So it's just, us it's, remember those who have died. It's a marker, you know. It's like right. it's like the you drive down the highway and there's those markers like where somebody died in a car accident, you know. Which mm -hmm. I mean, that's a whole nother, you know, question of. Uh, but I mean, as far as it, it, it doesn't mean that every single one of these people was a a, a, a practicing Christian, you know. Nope. So it's just, um, you know. <laughs> Crosses are convenient because you can hang little um, um, flowers and stuff on them real nicely. <laughs> so, I mean, realistically, that's some of them. That's kind of how they're used as a coat rack, you know, kind of thing for flowers or whatever, you know, not coats, but you know what I mean. Yep. So, well, like you said, that anyway. So, uh, okay, so maybe you have a different viewpoint. Always welcome your stuff at uh, podcast at crossfadenews.com. Speaking of feedback, uh, we heard from uh, our friend George, the ELCA pastor. Remember last week we were talking about uh, uh, their, their, their struggles within the ELCA of uh, gay clergy. And we you know, specifically had asked George to respond because he is an ELCA pastor and former missionary. And um, he writes and he says um, – you're asking me to express my feelings about some very difficult things. Uh, George, we understand that this is a very, very difficult thing for, for us, too. Mm -hmm. This business of the problems of human sexuality are so difficult that I feel only God knows the right answers. Or perhaps on this side of eternal life, God in his love and mercy presently chooses not to give us those answers. And we must simply trust him that he knows the right answer and will guide us to the path of truth. As Lutherans, we strongly believe that we are simultaneously sinner and saint, 
And as Luther said, daily we must begin by choosing the path of our baptism. This bold area of considering the ordination of gay clergy is frightening. What about ascribing an ordination to lead an exemplary life? Does God bless gay relationships? I don't know. Maybe God is busy making switches for people who ask such questions. Making switches for people who ask such questions. Um, that would be a reference to Luther, who said, um, "People ask, what did God do before He created the world?" And Luther said, "He created a baseball bat to hit people who ask questions like that, or switch to hit people, something like that." Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, as brothers in Christ, I ask you to pray for the ELCA as we continue to sin boldly and beg God for forgiveness. May we continue together to lift high the cross of Jesus. Thanks be to God. As a missionary in Liberia, the church used to accept polygamous families in the church, except for the father. But the Lutherans realized this was withholding grace <coughs> and decided to receive families, including the father, but instructing them that monogamy was the Christian ideal. I hope that in considering the ordination of gay persons, the church might deal with it in a similar matter. Some food for thought. Um, thank you, George. I appreciate your, your thing. Um, I think yeah, I think you asked some good questions. And, uh, you know, I, and I think you asked the right thing. But, you know, I would talk about it in terms of being something that's for truly very frightening as I think about it. Because I think this is um, the ramifications for the ELCA and the ramifications for – uh, it's it's partnership with other churches across the world in America and across the world is going to be deeply affected by whatever decision they make. And Dale and I do pray for your church body and we'll continue Absolutely. to. Yeah. Yeah. Really, really appreciate um, your very well thought out, um, you know, very, you know, I tell very heartfelt uh, expression of concern. Um, you know, I don't know, though. I mean, I, I guess I've got to say I, that. The Bible is clear on some of this, you know. I think, you know, as far as does God bless gay relationships, I would say that God blesses gay people because they're his children. Um, I don't know that I could say that God blesses gay relationships. In fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'd have to say no. He He's not going to... You know, is is he going to bless the people in it? Is he going to, um, you know, can he use that for good? Well, yeah, God uses sinful actions for good all the time. Um, right. Can he bless the relationship in the sense that um, people are 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 loving each other, are caring for each other, are you know, are even you know, outside of the uh, the sexual context, are um, are sharing his love you know, with each other as they care for each other. Yeah. You know, um, but I, I think that this question about, uh, leading an exemplary life, you know, obviously pastors and, you know, and, and George knows this, but, um, you know, pastors are, are called to a higher standard, right? Not that there's certain rules for pastors and other rules for lay people. Um, but that we're in the public eye. You know, and if a pastor, you know, if a, if a guy working at a machine shop, all right, has an affair, all right, that's sin, all right? It's it's damnable sin. It's also sin that Jesus died on the cross to forgive, all right? And he's not going to lose his job over that, all right? He's, uh, you know, his marriage is pretty tentative, okay? But he's not going to lose his job for that, all right? Pastor, you have an affair, that's it. I mean, you're out. Yeah, we are held to a higher standard. And so, but we'll see where things go. (sighs) Otherwise, we're just about done for the night. So uh, we're going to wrap this thing up and uh, pray that uh, God would um, bless all of you and watch all of you, watch over you. And we will uh, continue our conversations with you next week. With higher quality, slightly. (laughs) Okay. Good night, everybody. Take care. God bless. God bless.